bouncing back from Indiana and looking forward to Ohio State. What is it most that ails Nebraska football in this moment? We talk about it next. You are Locked On Nebraska, your daily Nebraska Cornhuskers podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Good morning and thank you for making Locked On Nebraska your first listen every day. We are free and available wherever you get podcasts and on YouTube, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, use the code Locked On College for twenty dollars off your first purchase. All right. Good morning. Happy Monday. Um, Connor Happer, Mitch Sherman with you. Uh, so I don't know if it feels any better today, but we have to move on. We have to move on. And, uh, the, the test now that awaits Nebraska is, oh, just a little game with Ohio state on Saturday. Uh, we'll hear from Matt rule, uh, today at his press conference. It'll be an interesting one. We'll talk about things that we might want to hear or think we will hear, um, a little bit later on, uh, mm-hmm. today in the show. But let's uh, let's let's dig into the to the nitty gritty here, Mitch. Like you, you mentioned it in the cold open, there. What are the things that that I, I don't need, we don't have to get into the things that are the most fixable. Let's identify first, yeah. right? And th- and then you get into fixing. What what are how did that happen on Saturday? And is it a byproduct of the things that are of things that aren't going right in this program? And if so, what are they? I'm of the belief that there's no silver lining in, in a in a situation like that. We we heard Matt Rule kind of attempt to say that he believes uh, a bad loss presents an opportunity to learn. You know, I think a 24 to 17 loss presents an opportunity to learn. A 56 to 7 loss presents an opportunity for things to go off the rails. You have to start worrying about the overall confidence, the overall direction of things. It's just Nebraska hasn't had games like this. The 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 sixty two to three game in twenty sixteen against Ohio State comes to mind, but that was Ohio State, you know. And and then we talked in our reaction show on Saturday night about the seventy to ten game against um, Texas, Texas Tech. Tech in two thousand four. Like, <laughs> otherwise they haven't lost games by this kind of a margin. Yeah, there've been thirty point losses, forty point losses, but the higher that margin gets the worse it is for for everyone involved so i think it's i think it's a good time to like take a step back and just say all right look this is really dark right now so what is it like it, it, if there's an if there's something here it gives us an opportunity i think to see a little more clear eyed about what it is that's really wrong with nebraska and then you can start to, to to chip away at fixing those things and i think crazy to say this because we've been talking about it for going on 15 years, maybe longer, maybe 20 years, what do they want to do on offense? What is the offensive identity? And maybe it's just a crutch to say that anytime the offense struggles because nothing looks good offensively, but I'm not sure what they want to do because we hear from Matt Rule that they want to get big, they want to get violent, they want to impose their will, and we see from Marcus Satterfield that he wants to throw the ball on eight consecutive downs when it's seven to nothing. Yeah, it's... um... It's scattershot, like, and it's panicky at times as well. And you know, I, th- I, th- I think it's also like a pick a play type of offense. Like, it always feels like they're trying to scheme um, for for a touchdown or for like a fifty yard play or something like that. I mean, and mm-hmm. and maybe you know th- the excuse there is is that happens as a result of Nebraska not being able to execute from down to down, right, in the run game, but get three four yards, whatever it might be. Um, but it gave up ob- obviously on that very quickly on Saturday against Indiana it hasn't been there the entire year. And, you know, it, it is possible to, you, know, you can go to a season and say, man, I just don't know how well Nebraska is going to be able to run it this year. And it is possible to at the halfway point or past the halfway point of the season that they get better at that. It should be the expectation. And it just hasn't. It's it, all of it has, ha- has kind of disintegrated. Like all, all of the offense, all of its pieces have sort of fallen in a direction where it's like, oh, this is regressing. This is this is not getting better. And the problem is, uh, one of the main problems I think is that now includes the quarterback. That that now includes Dylan Rayola. He is he is no longer, um, you know, the the guy who's like all these other things are problems. 
and he's doing well and you have to catch up to him. He is now part of the problem. So that was, that was, I think the worst development about Saturday because you, you only have, you know, you only have so many games with, with that type of talent Um, as your quarterback, you have to put the right people around him. That includes uh, the playmakers that you put at running back wide receiver offensive line. And then also, you know, the coaches that coach him as well. He, He is, I mean, his footwork is his is looks sloppy. It looks like he is uh, trying too hard at times. <laughs> it looks like he's trying not to make mistakes at times. He looks uh, skittish at times. Like um, I don't know that that thing has gone way way backwards in a very very quick manner. Not good. I agree with your assessment of Riola and what you said specifically, like this this the symptoms that we see from him of. Um, inconsistent play all of that stuff is is on base i think sometimes in this season we've looked for a way to rationalize riola's mistakes and just say well um the receiver didn't do a good enough job of of catching that ball when he threw a 50 50 ball and the defensive back took it away or uh he needs better protection uh, they have to have a running game around him. And all of those things can be true at the same time. It's true that he has not made the kind of progress that I think everyone expected and thought that he would here in the middle portion of the season. Probably to no fault of his own, but well, I mean, and, and I think that's, that's the, that's yeah. the instinct there is to, is to always put that, put that caveat on it because we know he's so talented because we know he can throw the ball 70 yards in the air and he has, um, this ability to be mature beyond his, his years, but all of those things haven't, they didn't show up in the, in the, in the Indiana game. And we didn't see him in the second half of the Rutgers game. So he's got to do some kind of a reset that apparently didn't occur during the bye week And I would still say that he's the least of their offensive issues, or he's not their, their most pressing offensive issue that if you fix some of the stuff that's going on, with the wide receivers, with the running game, and that includes the offensive line when you talk about those things, then he's going to give you what you need. But it's it's all together. Like it's, you know, I heard um, an, um, an uh, a- analysis after the, the game on Saturday that <clears throat> Indiana – it's 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 it has nothing to do i mean it has something to, their their success has a has something to do with the pieces but it's really so much more about the team and having totally. 11 11 people on the offensive side on the defensive side but we're talking offense here who are just in harmony and in sync together and in sync with what's going on on the sideline on the headset from the play caller it's all just like music at the at this moment as we see it, and it's it's far from that for Nebraska. So what do they want to do? And you know, last year I'll end it with this: last year Nebraska ha- had an offensive identity because it had to make up a new one in the middle of the season when its whole plan from the beginning got derailed because of injuries and turnover issues, and they 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 had an identity to be a an option team and a and a power run team and. It was okay, but it wasn't what what Satterfield wanted. And here they are now with the pieces that they spent an entire year putting together to run the offense they want to run, and they can't do it effectively. So it's a big issue that needs to be addressed, obviously, as Nebraska plays the final five games of its season. Well, and then, you know, this this one's hard, um, but it's come up at a variety of different times now. It's, it's It's the headspace. It's, it's, it's the mental stuff um Mm -hmm. and i like it cropped up again on saturday it was it was it was surprising um and jamari butler had a quote after the game about how you know sometimes they just kind of they got to that point and they put their heads down um in the game you know nebraska wasn't even nebraska wasn't all the way out of that game until after the first possession of the second half you know even though it just felt like oh boy i don't know how they're going to respond to this it just kept getting further and further away from them well, they were on the doorstep of making it 28 to 14 and Indiana's quarterback was done for the game. Yeah. Maybe they didn't know that at the moment that he was done for the game, not only done for the game, done for several weeks. So um, tough for the Hoosers for sure to lose Curtis work to that fingernail injury, but that's obviously a painful thing that's hard to throw with. So if it, if Nebraska scores, instead of um, throwing a pick that goes back 78 yards, it's 28, it's a two score game. Uh, you know, <clears throat> 
I think it's it's within reach at that moment. But yeah, and, obviously and it went like the other they, way. It, it shouldn't be a team. Uh, maybe there lies the problem, right? Like it shouldn't be. It shouldn't be a situation where you feel like, okay, we have to have something go right for us in order for us to really get some momentum. And, and that's that's in an essence how momentum works, right? From the you beginning. Just, from the yeah. beginning, you need something to go right. When it's 28 to 7, I think you can say that. Then you need something to go right to to, to you need a yeah. lucky bounce. But but, but like, it's zero no, to zero or seven to zero, no. But still, it, like it, it always feels like it hinges on, oh boy, if it doesn't go right right away, then we're in yeah. big trouble. Oh, yeah. You know, like it can't. Uh, that's that's not a way to to live but it does feel like that is that is definitely the 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 attitude or the feeling i guess right now from the outside looking in i hope it's not inside but from the outside looking in it looks like that like i i wonder how they're going to react if they go down seven to nothing and they did yeah. on saturday I, really I, quickly with a rushing touchdown a, th a thing that the defense had to allow all year i bet that was pretty shocking to the system and it didn't go well after that and it was on first down from five yards out. It didn't, it didn't, if, if Indiana had to run it four times or three times and, and got one yard, two yards, two yards, maybe that's a, a little easier for the black shirts psyche, but there's, there's, they're, they're, they're still too, <clears throat> as, as you said, they're, they're too dependent on things just going as planned. If something yeah. goes off track, there's, there's, there's too much danger of the whole thing falling off the rails. And that's what we saw. Um, I want to say one more thing about identifying the problems here and your your headspace, the mental part of it, I think very much plays into this. And then we have a third topic that we'll get to after the break. But I, I think just the whole details part of, of the, the program, the game, this is more of like an on-field stuff. I think the details are are buttoned up away from away from the field, away from Saturday. But when you start to talk about the issues that have hurt Nebraska most over the last decade, whether it's turnovers, it's often been turnovers. It was again, turnovers on Saturday penalties. We've seen that crop up this year. And then special teams, like these are the, the peripheral things about football that aren't just get a first down, get a stop, get off the field. These things have to work. These are the things that, that take a team that's in the middle of the big 10 and either puts them in like the bottom quadrant of the Big Ten, or the or the second to bottom quadrant, or or you move up a level. Like it, historically, these are the things that Iowa and Wisconsin have been good at, and they're just horrendous for Nebraska right now. And and turnovers have been good this year until Saturday, but historically, right now with the program, or or big picture with the program, turnovers, penalties, special teams, they can't figure it out. All right. Appreciate you guys uh, liking, subscribing, watching along with us, listening along with us today and every day. Uh, continue to do so. Hit the subscribe on on YouTube as we continue on throughout the show today. Plenty more to get to as we go forward. It's Locked on Nebraska podcast. All right. Let's talk a little bit about Z-Biotics. Z-Biotics pre-alcohol prebiotic drink or probiotic drink rather is the world's first genetically, genetically engineered probiotic. It was invented by PhD scientists to tackle rough mornings after drinking. Here's how it works. Uh, when you drink, alcohol gets converted into a toxic byproduct in the gut. This It's this byproduct, not the dehydration that's to blame for your rough next day. Pre-alcohol produces an enzyme to break this byproduct down, just remember to make Z-Biotics your first drink of the night, then drink responsibly, and you'll feel your best tomorrow. So that's how you use it, basically. You take you the Z-Biotics is your first drink of the night, then you drink responsibly, of course, as always, pace yourself, hydrate, then get a good night of sleep, and you'll be able to enjoy tomorrow fresh as a daisy. Wake up feeling refreshed and ready to take on the day. Head to zbiotics.com slash locked on college. To learn more and to get 15% off your first order when you use Locked On College at checkout, Zbiotics backed with 100% money back guarantee. So if you're unsatisfied for any reason, they'll refund your money, no questions asked. Remember to head to zbiotics.com slash locked on college. Use that code locked on college at checkout for 15% off. Okay, welcome back to the Locked On Nebraska podcast on this Monday. I'm Mitch Sherman from The Athletic, Connor Happer of 1620 The Zone in Omaha is with me. Uh, we'll talk about this first, and then we'll get back to our original subject. Got one more thing I want to discuss on the what is wrong with Nebraska football conversation. But usually we hold the mailbag, Connor, for Thursday or Friday if we're combining it with our predictions. 
Uh, we'll do one again this week, I think, as long as it's not completely out of control. Um, I got a question sent to me on email Sunday from James that I thought would make an interesting topic in here in this moment. He wrote to us on the subject of Nebraska continuing to lose meaningful games and asked our thoughts on the size of the roster. So not something that we talk a lot, a lot about in the season. And James ones, wonders if it's, quote, just too big to effectively handle, develop, and coach. Um, it's more a theory than a question, but he's saying that if Nebraska can execute, can't execute basic skills of the kicking game, is the large roster even worth having? So interesting point. Um, he thinks maybe that the attention to coaching players on the roster who don't play takes away from coaching the players who do. So his his final analysis, anything's worth looking at. And there are big changes coming to yeah. college football rosters, which is why I want to do include this here instead of just jamming it into a mailbox. His suggestion is for Matt Rule to reserve two to five spots for in-state kids or walk-on players who want to walk on, make it a huge honor, and then tell the rest, respectfully, go to an FCS school and earn your way to Nebraska through the portal. You know, that might be, and I don't know if he means two to five per year or two to five like within the big picture of the program. I, I would say two to five per year is probably realistic considering where the rosters are going to going to be at in that 105 range um, after after the season, Nebraska has a lot of cutting down to do it for its roster, which is it is 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 going to be you know the way this the way this thing's going um, is you know unless we just have a remarkable turnaround in November and the Huskers win eight games and everybody feels good after the season, it's going to be really kind of a um, you know an uncomfortable dance after this season yeah. because. You need to upgrade the players on the field. You have to surround Dylan Raiola with more talent. You're going to be losing a ton of veterans, a ton of seniors. You have this recruiting class coming in. You have to cut numbers and then add out, add out of the portal. So, wow, that's, that's going to be – and I, I think what James is talking about is going to kind of happen just by the nature of it because of where the numbers need to be in 2025. Yeah, I don't think it's the worst thing in the world. I mean, from that standpoint, that's 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 pretty interesting. Like to have an actual set number that you can hit, rather than oh, it's this moving target, and if we end up here, then we end up here. Like it, it, it maybe brings more urgency to the to the player acquisition, you know, piece of it, which is probably not the worst thing in the world. As far as the as far as James's main point of like. Hey, maybe there's just too too many people on the roster to effectively like get all these details hammered in. I'd say like I, there there might be some truth to that, um, but I'd also say like during the season, Nebraska's Nebraska's coaches, um, you know, they're 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 just not coaching the people after number about fifty or sixty on the roster as hard as the 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 those top guys that are actually going to play for you. Like I know I know that. You know, they always want to coach everybody hard at the same time and everybody's getting reps and stuff like that. But it's just not it's just not realistic. Like those guys are getting reps throughout the week because there's only there's only limited time that you can accomplish what you want to accomplish. And you have to be ready to put the product out there on the field on Saturday. So like there might be there might be a twinge of of truth to that. Um, but I don't know if you if you you know, you're going to see a whole bunch of whittling down, like Mitch said in the uh in the off season here as we head towards something completely new and completely different in college football so maybe it, that's obviously going to have its its major major effects but I, I i i wouldn't say that the roster is too big to like i i don't think you can't do it with the size of roster nebraska has right now that's that's what i'll say as a counterpoint to your uh suggestion that nebraska doesn't spend as much time coaching the players and maybe the bottom 40% of the roster during the season. You do remember that Matt rule hung up his hat as head coach during the, the lead up to the Rutgers game to go yeah. coach the scout team. Now I, that that's, that's, that's neither here nor there. I don't, I don't, I don't intend that to mean that he's not paying attention to the top players. He is. And the scout team serves a purpose and There's there was a motivation, the right? <laughs> yeah, right. There was a motivational, um, tactic that was that was involved there. I think the other thing to consider here, and and I, it's an interesting theory. I don't believe it to be true. And if it is true, then Nebraska's mismanaging and, and and they're not handling their practices the right way because you now have twice the the, the number of coaches 
from just six months ago who were able to be out on the field right. working with players in practice. Previous to this, it was just the 10 assistants and everybody else supposedly was on the sidelines. They could contribute in the office, but they're not coaching on the field in practice and in games. And now they can. So now it's like an NFL setup where you can have 20 coaches who are at work at, in practice. If anything, the question to ask might be, are there too many cooks in the kitchen? Are there too many coaches out there? Are the messages getting across in the same way as as a year ago or 10 years ago when players at a position group only had one voice at practice? Now they may yeah. have two or three voices at practice. So uh, either one is an interesting question to ask, but I think the second one about managing the number of voices that the players are hearing in order to effectively develop and coach is probably more relevant in today's world of college football than just thinking, well, how do they even get these guys to play when there's a hundred of them out the 130 of them out there on the practice field? Yeah. You have to make sure that message is consistent. And that was, that was one thing that I, I still think this staff does really well, right? It starts at the head coach and then it just trickles down and down and down. But the more people you get involved in the actual one-to-one -one coaching, um, the more difficult it is to, it is to sort of do that. I don't Can't think be. I don't think that that's a that that's like a you know a thing that I would think about in in uh, as far as a problem for Nebraska's program right now. But it is an interesting sort of overarching view on 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 what it looks like. And once again, keep in mind that it's all going to be totally different um, potentially starting next year. Last piece of this segment, and we'll go back to the original question that we posed at the start of this podcast about what ails Nebraska football in the big picture. I wonder about the attention and the scrutiny that Nebraska receives, and all the resources are a result of that, or many of the resources are a result of that. If people don't care about the program, then the program doesn't have the ability to build big buildings and fund NIL. That can empower Nebraska, and largely that's what it does. I think in most moments it empowers Nebraska. In a moment like this when you lost 56-7, to seven, and, man, social media was a cesspool this weekend. Real people bad. are yelling at people are yelling at the players. People are yelling at Matt Rule. People are yelling at the assistant coaches and the coordinators. There, there's, there's a, a minority, I think, of fans out there who want everybody to be fired. Um, that I, I hope that the players and the coaches and, and others in our position – aren't are, aren't paying attention to that like i saw that our our pod from sunday had i don't know 200 comments or something like that on the on the in the um in the youtube uh comment section and i i'm sorry i'm sorry if you commented on there and you had a legitimate question for us because i i can't wait into that like i gotta <laughs> i got i gotta do my job and look out for my own well-being here so i don't want to get into that but but think about it from the player's perspective um yeah. this this microscope um it creates a lot of pressure and I think that's something that, uh, you know, all coaches who have been in this position that Matt rules in have had to look at. And it's a it's a potential potential issue right now. Yeah, this is a bigger this is a way big topic for um, that could probably have its own show. But, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> the, the, the attention is both good and bad and it is never relenting. Right. You know, if 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 you're bad at most places, it just goes away. If if you're bad at Indy, if Kurt Signetti comes in and he's three and three out of the gate instead of six and zero or four and three instead of instead of seven and zero, nobody's talking about him and nobody cares. Right. And right. nobody's at the games and nobody's tweeting at the players at Nebraska. If <laughs> you're five and two and you just got beat by fifty points, um, you know you're still five and two. Yes, but nobody cares that you're five and two. You just got beat by fifty points and it doesn't go away and people don't forget. So um, this this is a weight that's hung on the program for years and years and years and decades and decades and decades. And you just have to have the right attitude about it, I guess, because you have to manage it all the time. And to be clear, Nebraska is not unique in that situation. It's unique like within its own, you know, nothing else like it in this state. But, you know, go to Oklahoma this week, go to Auburn this week, heck, go to Alabama this week. And they're yeah. having these these kind of conversations, too. They didn't lose 56 to seven, but they're equally unhappy. So, um you got to deal with it if you want to play at the at those kind of places. So, all right, when we come back, we are going to discuss what Matt Rule might have to discuss in his Monday press conference. It's going to be an interesting one on tap uh, for the head coach in Lincoln today. That's coming up next after this break. 
Okay, Mitch Sherman here to tell you about game time. We are getting deep into the college football season. The World Series is set. It's set, right? Uh, the uh, the yeah. Dodgers they won last night, beat the beat the Mets. I went to sleep before that game ended. Yeah, we got right. uh, we got Yankees, Dodgers, and then we'll have uh, we'll have uh, Rutgers and USC on on Friday night as That's well. Right. So a real New York, LA situation going no on. No kidding, no kidding. That couldn't have worked out better for Fox to have that prelude to the uh, uh, to the to the. Well, it could have worked out better if if either one of those teams were having a better season. But uh, and I'm talking yeah. about Rutgers and and Rutgers and USC. Is that what USC. it is? Yep. Yeah. All right. Well, um, the bigger point is that the playoffs are here. Um, the playoffs are, are, are not here in college football, but the, the world series is here in baseball and game time is an authorized ticket marketplace of major league baseball. It makes getting tickets and tickets faster and easier prices go down on the app, the closer you get to first pitch. So if you want to go to a world series game, maybe you're listening to this podcast in New York or LA, maybe you're a huge life, lifelong Dodgers or Yankees fans. They haven't played in the world series against each other since 1981, whatever it is that you need to get to this fall concerts, MLB games, college football games. If it's a hot ticket, it's there on game time. Take the guesswork out of buying tickets with game time, download the app, create an account, use the code locked on college for $20 off your first purchase terms apply. Again, download the app today, game time, last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. All right, a few minutes left here on the Lockdown Nebraska podcast. Thanks for listening with this Connor Hyper Mitch Sherman with you. Um, so today is uh, Monday press conference day. <laughs> How does I imagine? I don't know. Will this be any different than a normal um, Matt Rule yeah. press conference after a loss? I, the yeah. the questions will be more intense. Will he react any differently? This will be an interesting test because in normal, um, you know, in situations, at least. Yeah, they haven't in a situation like this before, really, with the exception no. of Michigan loss last yeah, year. No, I, I don't. It wasn't. Michigan wasn't like this. This is yeah. worse. Yeah. So his his kind of uh, stock response is, yeah, you know, I watched the tape and it wasn't necessarily as bad as 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 it looked, probably, and this, this, and this, and we just got to get better at doing this, doing the things that we do, and and we'll move on and we'll get better from this. Like that's that's usually been the response. But that will be tough to hear today for yeah. for Nebraska fans. I think it'll be a little different. I think he'll probably have something to say at the beginning. Usually, the, the, he comes in and and it just goes to questions. I, I would think he'll want to say something at the beginning because they didn't have a lot of answers after the game. Understandably, they were shell shocked after that game on on Saturday in Bloomington. And he comes into the the media room minutes after he's just addressed his team, like what he's going to say to the media. It's important because he's talking to the fans in that moment too. But uh, he, he, you know, he's thinking about it maybe as he's walking down the hallway to come into that room. Now he's had closer to 48 hours to think about it. So I would think that his, you know, his messaging is always very good. And this is a place, this, this doesn't win him any games, but, or it, it doesn't directly win him any games, but his messaging and what he says to the, it, it sure, it helps make him a, a well-rounded CEO, a good, a, a good coach, but um, it's definitely better than the alternative. And some coaches, you know, are not good at this. Matt rules, very good at this press conference part of it. So I'll be interested to see like, what, it, what is his messaging going to be? I think he'll probably come in prepared with something to, uh, to say today. I, you know, I wonder, I'm interested in Connor and what, and what you, what you're curious about from him today, but I wonder, we kind of talked about in the, in the last segment about the, the, um, the scrutiny that Nebraska faces. And I wonder what kind of concerns I've, I've written this down a few questions for, for rule. See, I'm approaching this press conference different than I do usually too. Yeah. Um, what kind of concerns exist after a loss like that lops, so lopsided um, that you have team leaders like Jamari Butler talking about confidence issues. What kind of concerns exist after that game that might be different from a game that you lose by one score or in overtime. And I'm curious if Matt rule will, will go down that road and talk about his teams, his team psyche, their mindset. Yeah. I, I can't imagine he'll be like, Hey, yeah, well, you know, you gotta be <laughs> worried about losing them, you know, and stuff like that. Cause they're no, cause they're still five and two. Right. And now everyone can look at it and say, well, they're probably going to be five and three after this week. And then all of a sudden that pressure gets tighter and tighter and tighter. And you look around like, I, I, there are obviously things like that. Nebraska, it's it's all the more reason that Nebraska needs some sort of a, a, a reset, a refresh, a re 
start, whatever it might be, um, to to get itself centered going into these final five games. Because it it can't like it can't just be, oh, we have to get better, and you know we will, and it's a process to get better. Because mm-hmm. Nebraska can't only win five games this year, <laughs> like that. They can't. It can't. Like point blank. Period. I I, I wish. I, you know, I wish it was a long drawn out, you know, process and, and everything could work out that way, but Nebraska can't win five games this year. It, it already has five. It can't just win five. Yeah. You could, you could argue that I think that the Michigan game last year or any of the losses last year were somewhere close to what the blueprint looks like for rebuilding a program. Nowhere in the blueprint. Is there anything that looks remotely like what happened on Saturday at, at Indiana? Yeah, huge wrench in it for sure. Um, you know, people are going to want, and, and we've seen this this outcry on on social media and in, in the comment section. Like, I, I think there's a, there's a segment of people who want the the media to go in there and say, "Why don't you fire this coach or that coach?" And I don't know that that is a productive way to uh, to go with with the head coach. He's he's if he decides to make a change to some kind of coaching responsibilities during the season, he's going to tell us about it. And then we can, we can, we can dive into that, but doing that is, is more like, it's more like one of us walking in and saying, you should fire this coach. Right. And, and I'm telling you that, and I want you to hear that and react to that now. And that's, that's just not really the, the, the way that it goes. Now, somebody might ask it, somebody might come in and say, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to get this off my chest and, and we can start the discussion this way. I think that discussion can be, and it needs to be had, like, what are you going to do to address these problems with play calling with special teams? But it's not, it's, it's, I I don't, at least I don't expect that it's going to be done in a way where there's a, a demand or just a, a straight question coming out. Like, why don't you fire coach X or coach Y? So Probably yeah. not the way that, it, that the, 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 this this is going to be handled today. Yeah, and and you know a, another way to approach it maybe is like, hey, okay, so you know we know that he wouldn't necessarily respond to that, um, you know, and, and that's not what it's about. I guess I get it to people's point, like you know, you, you're not supposed to care how he's going to respond to it, but like maybe a, a, an easier way to approach it would be like, okay, does because we're talking about the offensive coordinator, right? Does the offensive coordinator have everything he needs to be able to have success and, you know, and, and sort of mm-hmm. start there and um, yeah. maybe the answer is no. And then, okay, well then maybe this is a longer building process than we thought or whatever. Um, and maybe the answer is yes. And then you, the, the blame is immediately, you know, squarely placed on, on that situation. So, um, you know, you kind of, you, you want to, you want to hear about the process of like how they're going about things. That's, you know, and, and it doesn't have to be like here, here are the results. Um, here's what's going to happen all the time. I know people want it to be that way. It's just, it's not that antagonistic of an environment. <laughs> right. Exactly. Like we're not, we're not going into this trying to make him mad. That's, that's yeah. not what it's about. Like we want to get real answers and you don't get real answers from asking threatening or accusatory kind of questions, like a look at me kind of question. We're not going to put the can well, they do put the camera on the media now. Um, thank you to the, uh, to the huskers.com people for doing that. So, I, I, these things are going to be addressed and I'm not, I'm not downplaying the importance of actually addressing like what's going on with the offensive coordinator, what's going on with the special teams coordinator. Why aren't the receivers getting open when they should against the players that they're, that they're matched with? Like we, we need, we will, we will try to get to this, but it's not going to be done in the sense of like, you need to fire this guy right now. What do you, what do you have to say about that? Just Um, not maybe as direct as you would like it to be. Right. Like you, you, you approach it from in, in a way that, um, hopefully can be can can generate a productive conversation. One one thing, last thing that I'm curious about today is <clears throat> about Tony White and the defense because it was so out of whack on Saturday, and they've talked during the season about getting Tony out of his comfort zone. And then Nebraska brought John Butler in in the off season, and I think they're doing things that are more multiple on the defensive side. I wonder uh, from Rule's perspective how that impacts Tony White's ability to adjust during a game when they get down 14 to nothing against uh, 14 to 7, 21 to 7 against Indiana. And in his old system, in, in running his 3 3 5 without some of the, the twists that they've installed this year, if it's possible that he might have adjusted better because he knows the ins and outs of all that he's doing and perhaps 
um, the changes they've made defensively with the ske- with the scheme this year um, are 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 taking away from from his ability to be comfortable in in that situation. Interesting. Yep. Something to look forward to today and uh, and a, a talking point, certainly for the rest of the week. All right. That's it for us today. Connor Happer, Mitch Sherman. Appreciate you guys making Locked on Nebraska your first listen today. Now go check out the Locked on College Football podcast. The link to that show is in the description of this show, so you don't have to go anywhere to find it. That's all part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day.